Greetings, I'm Pastor Theodore Faison. And I'm Pastor Linda Faison. Welcome to the Living Water Christian Center Church, where the word is plentiful and the spirit of the Lord lives. We are glad that you have decided to join us today. We pray that the word of God will bless you and challenge you during these difficult times. We love to
And that's what Moses did. He stood before the Lord and he prayed to God and he said things uh, to the effect of, Lord, what will the people say? They'll say that you brought them out of Egypt but you couldn't deliver them. Now, those kind of words, I don't think the Lord really it bothers him what people say because he's God and he knows who he is. But the idea that Moses stood there and, and pleaded on behalf of the folks like a shepherd, he pleaded on behalf of the people, the Lord stayed his, his wrath. Because the Lord was going to say, um, you know, just stand aside, I'm going to wipe these folks out, and I'll start with you and your family. And Moses pleaded with them not to do that. So that's what we mean by state of the gap. Um, the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, when he was called before God, when he was called to serve in the year that King Uzziah died, he said, I am an unclean man, and I dwell among people of unclean lips. He started confessing who he was and the sins of the people. Nehemiah did the same thing. In Nehemiah chapter 1, he confessed the sins of the people of the children of Israel. And he, when he heard about the destruction of the walls in Jerusalem and how Jerusalem was broke down, he started praying to God, and when his, in his prayer, he prayed and, and confessed the sins of the people. There, there's a time in America where we need to confess. We, the church, need to confess some sins. Because the sins of our country are ours too. I'm talking to the church folk. There's our sin. The sins of America go way back. It goes back to the days of Columbus. I mean, ever since Columbus was discovered in the Caribbean, there's been racism. There's been uh, white supremacy. There's been, uh, there's been bigotry and, and sins and people and oppression and things have been done wrong to people, to different people, just because of the difference in the folk. All right, and so what we have here, we have a situation now in America, and with, this is not a new situation, what we have here since the death of Mr. Floyd, we have riots, we have protests, we have riots, and we have people who are angry, we have people who are frustrated, we have people who are grieved, and America is hurting, and America needs somebody to stand in the gap. We need an intercessor, and I want to tell you, I'm not calling on the White House to do the intercession, I'm saying it should be the church. We the people who are called by his name, we are the church, we are the ones we have the fellowship, we have the relationship, we have the access to the living God. It is up to the church to build the head, to stand in the gap on behalf of this great country. Listen, we have a dark history. It goes way back. I mean, it goes back even before the founding of this nation. Even before Columbus showed up here, um, our history goes back further than that. And so what happens is, is that there's a lot of sin a lot of oppression, a, a lot of mistreatment of people by people in power and by, and by the dominant culture of the day, of everything. So this is what we have here. Ezekiel wrote this, the Lord said this to Ezekiel, and in verses 29 and 30 describes us even though it was written thousands of years ago. It says that the people of the land have oppressed and exercised robbery. I've been, actually, I've been told that we actually founded the country on robbery. Took it. Took it from the Native Americans. Look what else it says here. And it says, have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. The stranger is anybody who's not like you. And so when we talk about racism, when we talk about bigotry, we talk about treat people different because of who they are or because they're not the same as you are. And he said, I sought a man to stand among them. He sought somebody to stand on behalf of the people, to intercede on behalf of the people, to be a mediator. That's what Jesus does for us, by the way. He's the mediator between God and man. He stood on our behalf and mediated the salvation that we have for us. So I'm looking for a man to stand in the gap to, to, um, to, to mediate, to, to, um, to intercede, but I don't have one. He said, there's not one there. And this is written, and, and Ezekiel was on the scene at the time. All right? But the Lord's not talking about Ezekiel necessarily. 
He saw God, I need a leader, I need a prophet, I need a man of God um, or a woman of God, someone to stand there on behalf of the people. And he did not find one. So because there was nobody to intercede, there was no priest, there was no prophet, there was no intercessor, there was nobody to plead on behalf of the folks, the Lord poured out his wrath and his indignation upon the folks, upon the people. We don't want that. We don't want the wrath of the Lord poured out upon us. It's bad enough that we are reaping things that we have sown as a country. We reap these things that we have sown. It's bad enough that we have these things. We have this situation that we have. We have a history of enslaving people and a history of bigotry and a history of oppressing folks who are different. We have this history. You know, we have the trail of tears. We have the internment of Japanese American citizens. We have those kind of things, and we have we have abortion. We have the disrespect for marriage, and these things are going on in America, on and on, have been going on for a long time. And the Lord, in His mercy and grace, has held back. I believe, has held back His wrath and punishment on us. We are what Peter called a perverse generation. But I believe because of the church because the presence of the Holy Spirit that things aren't as bad as they could be. So it's up to the church, it's up to us, it's up to the people of God to call upon the name of the Lord. That's what the Lord told that's what the Lord told um, Solomon when he built the temple and they made these great sacrifices and Solomon prayed before God and Solomon understood how the people were and he, and he said things like you know, Lord, when we, when we fall back and when we go into idolatry and when we disobey you, um, I want you to be attentive to our prayers. And when we realize we're wrong, be attentive to our prayers. And the Lord said, I hear you pray. I hear you praying and I understand. And here's what I'm going to do. He said, my people, which are called by my name, he said, if I sin, let me skip, I'll skip a little bit. He said, if I send the pestilence and I send the sword, and I punish you through oppression and things like that. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear, I will hear them from heaven, and I will forgive their sins and hear the Lamb. Pastor Linda talked about this last week. He said he will hear our prayer, and he will forgive our sins and heal the Lamb. So I'm saying to us that it's up to the church, it's up to the people of God, it's up to the people of God to go before the Lord in prayer. We need to repent. We need to repent for ourselves. We need to repent for this great land that we're part of. We need to repent for the people who are doing things and don't know the Lord. We need to repent for what's going on in high places in government. We need to repent. We, the people of God, who know the Lord, we're the ones that need to repent. Because the others don't know to. They don't know to ask for forgiveness. They don't know to repent for sins. They don't know the living God like you know him. So it's up to us. Just like Ezekiel did, just like Nehemiah did, just like Isaiah and, and Moses and even Joshua, you know, and, they, and different leaders of back in the day, they repent for God. They repent before the living God. Guess what? I, I, read, I read something by um, President Andrew, I'm not Andrew, President John Adams, and I'm going to read just an excerpt for you, okay? President John Adams, in 1798, called a proclamation a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. I don't know why this is not showing up in my history book. Okay, but listen, he called for a day, and I'm just going to read just a little bit. As the safety and prosperity of nations ultimately and essentially depend on the protection and the blessing of Almighty God. And the national acknowledgement of this truth is not only an indispensable duty which the people owe to him, but a duty whose natural influence is favorable to the promotion of that, of that morality and piety without which social happiness 
cannot be exist, cannot exist, nor the blessings of the freedom of government be enjoyed. He said, so many words, he said, we need to recognize something. This is John Adams, 1798. He said, we need to recognize that what we have depends on God. It depends on him. John, oh, by the way, side note, John Adams was one of the founding fathers of their own slaves, by the way. Even though he benefited from slavery because um, he lived in the White House. But getting back to this, he 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 said we need to we need to recognize that we what we have and what we expect to have is dependent on the Lord. Last night I was reading, I was reading um, the letter from Birmingham Prison by um, Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's a long letter. It's like a letter, like a kind of letter that Paul wrote, mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul. And and I can't read that to you today because it will take about 30 minutes to get through it or longer. But he was saying, he was saying the famous quotes that people use, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And he also said that what affects someone directly affects all of us indirectly. And in his letter, he was calling, he was responding to the clergymen of, of Birmingham, Alabama, who were saying that he should calm down, it's not the right time, um, what he's doing is making matters worse, and those kind of things. And what Dr. King was um, telling them is that we just can't calm down, we have to do something about what's going on. This stuff is wrong, and we just can't sit there and watch it. And so I'm telling us, we, the people of God, we are the ones now. We're the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit. That's what the scripture says. We are the ones who need to step up in prayer, especially in prayer. I mean, go, we should go ahead and um, protest and march and do all those things, peacefully, of course. Peaceful assembly is one of our benefits of the um, Bill of Rights. But we need to be praying. We need to be standing in the gap. We need to confess our sins before the living God and confess the sins of our nation and ask for forgiveness, ask for mercy, ask for grace, and ask for a remedy. We need to pray for people in leadership. We need to pray for the presidents, Congress, the judges, the government. We need to be praying for them. The word of God tells us to pray for these people, that we can have peaceful lives. It says that we need to be interceding on their behalf. As much as we complain, we need to be praying. You know, when someone does something, a high place does something we don't like, we talk about it. And we complain about it, and we share with people and say, look at this one, look at that one. Look what he or she is doing. Okay, so we do that. So we need to also be praying for that same individual, especially the ones we disagree with. We need to put them before the Lord in prayer and ask for God's mercy and ask for God to, to direct them and to give them wisdom, give them direction. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. It's like the water, it's like the river. He just turns it any way he wants. The Lord can change the mind of anybody, of anyone. He can change the mind. It's up to him. He can do it, but it's up to us to approach him, to pray and go through. You know, because what's happening today is not new. Um, Mr. Floyd's death is not a new thing. It's been going on. I had my seventh graders look up Rodney King, 1991. And that was one of the first times we were able to actually see something on video. This is before cell phones, before everybody had their own ability to record things. You know, some amateur photographer just happened to be there and filmed the whole beating of this man. And all he was doing, well, they arrested him for drunk driving. I believe, but they just beat him down. He was a big black man, and as a big black man, he must have posed a threat to them, even though he wasn't doing anything threatening, and they beat him down. Then you go back in time, you go back to Emmett Till, the boy who was taken from out of his house and, and beat and burned and things, and all tortured and things like that, and you go back further in time, you know, with just slavery and, and the lynchings and all those other activities that were done against black folk and people of color. So in closing, I'm just saying, saints, it's up to us. We need to pray. 
We need to intercede. We need to petition heaven. What does the scripture say? It says, be anxious for nothing. But in all things with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto the Lord and the God of peace. That, you know, the peace of God that passes all understanding, he'll give you that peace that passes your understanding. And, and the Lord will heal these things. He will work these things out for us and for our fellow citizens and for our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and strangers and things like that. But he will do that for us. Yes. Amen? So if we would pray, if we would dedicate ourselves to this time of prayer, I don't mean just we're going to get the we're going to get together one afternoon and have a prayer meeting. I'm talking about regular prayer, everyday kind of praying, while you're praying, while you're asking, and while you're seeking the Lord for the stuff that you want for your personal business. Ask God about your country. Ask God about the leadership. Ask God about your neighbors and, and different ones, and pray for them. This way, we want, because we want to live in peace. We want these things to settle down. We want righteousness in government. The only way you get righteousness in government, you have to have righteous people in government. And we need to be praying people. And of course, you need to vote. You know you need to vote. Amen? You know you need to vote. And we need to pray. And we need to seek the Lord's face. We need, what can I do? What else can I do to alleviate some of this pain and some of this frustration and anger that's going on. Amen. So, that being said, we're going to pray now and ask the Lord to do some things for us and for our country. Amen. Father, we're so grateful because you are a God. You are our God. And we are your children. And on behalf of this nation, First, we ask your forgiveness. We ask your forgiveness for the things that have gone wrong, for the darkness that's in our history, for the sins that are being committed today and ongoing. We ask your forgiveness for those things even now. You know what they are, and you know how it works. We ask your forgiveness for sins right now. And we ask your mercy. Mercy, Lord, on this people. Mercy on this nation. We ask for your grace and forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you heal those who are anxious and angry and grieved and frustrated. We pray for healing for the family of George Floyd. We pray for healing for the families of the other victims whose lives have been taken and who have not seen justice. We ask for you their healing and their peace right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we ask that you put an unction in us, your people, that we will step up, that we will be the ones to stand in the gap, to build the heads, to continually intercede for the people. Because we know that you hear us. And we know that your ears and your eyes attend unto our prayers in our hearts. We thank you for these things, Lord. And we're praying that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart is acceptable to you today. And we thank you for all these things even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We're so grateful today. We ask that you continue to pray for us. Pray for this great nation. Pray for the people of the world. Because there's so much going on. We're not the only ones this situation is happening in Europe and in Asia and Africa and all over the world. So this is our prayer. Amen. We're going to go ahead and, um, and worship the Lord in communion today. We thank God what we do is we celebrate. We celebrate Jesus and all that he's done for us and all that he suffered. We remember the things he suffered and the sacrifice he made for our salvation. 
grateful for today. Jesus was celebrating Passover with his disciples. He was in the upper room celebrating Passover. And while he was celebrating Passover, he instituted, um, he instituted a remembrance for what he was about to do. He told them that the, the bread represented his body, which is broken for them. Because he's, he's, he's predicting the things that he's about to go through. And the fruit of the vine represents his blood, which is shed on their behalf. And that's what we do. We remember what Christ has done for us. It's not a, it's not a memorial, and it's not a thing that we grieve over. It's more of a celebration. We celebrate what Jesus has done for us through his own body and blood, and we're grateful for it. And so he took the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body. It represents my body, which is broken for you. And we take the bread and we eat it together in Jesus' name. And Father, we're grateful for all that Christ has suffered on our behalf. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And we thank you for all that Jesus went through for us. On his way to Calvary. On his way to the cross. We're so grateful in Jesus' name. And he took the cup and said, This is the New Testament in my blood. And what we understand through tradition and through study is that there's no uh, remission of sins without the shedding of blood. The wages of sin is death. But we're grateful that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so even before Christ, his own sacrifice is the perfect Lamb of God. Um, blood was shed to cover and make atonement for the sins of the people. But now Jesus said, this is the New Testament in his blood. And it represents his blood that he's about to shed on behalf of all the world. And so we take the cup and we drink it together in Jesus' name, knowing that he shed his blood and he gave his life for us. And we are grateful for the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from sin, the life-giving blood. We're thankful that we are the purchased possession, purchased by the blood of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ himself. And Father, we celebrate these things because he did not just only die for us, but he was risen again on the third day. And we're thankful for all that Christ has done. And we thank you, Father, for allowing us this time together to celebrate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. On behalf of our pastors, Theodore and Linda Faison, we would like to thank you for joining the Living Water Christian Center Church for our Sunday morning virtual service. Although the physical doors of our church may be closed, our ministry is committed to spreading the gospel message and staying connected with you as we shelter in place. To support our ministry with your tithes and offering, you can use PayPal at livingwaterccc, Cash App at Living H2O Church, or Zell at 973-902-9933. If you need any assistance or would like to send any prayer requests, you can contact us at 973-902-9933 or livingwater374 at gmail.com. We are also available via direct message at any of our social media platforms. Follow us at Living Water H2O Church on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated on our virtual worship services, Sunday school classes, prayer meetings, and Bible studies. Once again, thank you for tuning in. Be blessed and stay safe.